Hello, it's really lovely to be able to be speaking about live music again, and a special privilege to be marking the centenary of the lark ascending in its violin and piano version. I'll be asking in this piano talk, what is it about this piece that makes it so enduringly popular? And part of the answer to that is also another question, which is, how does Vaughan Williams manage to say something so deep and profound with such apparently simple material? How does he say so much with so little? So, as you've probably guessed, we're not filming this in my personal sitting room, I wish it were, but this is the rather grand setting of King's Western House, and as I look out there, I can see a straight avenue down the grounds. It is rather wonderful with all these portraits as well. And perhaps, perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually the piano on which Vaughan Williams composed The Lark Ascending. We don't know for sure, but it feels probable. So, the squire that lived here, Squire Philip Napier Miles, hosted Vaughan Williams on a number of occasions, and he also had a protege called Mary Hall, who was a virtuoso violinist, and together the composer and the violinist worked on The Lark Ascending prior to its first performance just down the road in Shirehampton Hall. So you might think, just looking at this decor, I mean, I'm looking at moose horns, I think, up there, and a, a wonderful chandelier. You might think from this that Vaughan Williams moved only in rather high circles, was part of high society. And he certainly was. Really, for all of his life, he was very much part of the establishment. He couldn't really avoid that, having been born into a lineage that included the Darwins and the Wedgwoods. But there's nothing aloof about his music. In fact, his lifelong credo was to make it universally accessible. So whether you were the commoner or the squire, you'd feel affected by it. You'd feel directly connected to it. And early on in his career, he wrote this essay where he said that music should come from the people and it should be for the people. We, the composers, he said, should cultivate a sense of musical citizenship. So how do you do that in music? Well, rather like Kodai and Bartok in Hungary or Janáček in the Czech Republic and before him Smetana and Vorjak, Vaughan Williams went around collecting folk songs and folk dance. And you can imagine him, I think, with his friend Gustav Holst on his push bike in lanes just around here and in Wiltshire and Gloucestershire and on the east coast in Norfolk just trying to transcribe ditties from the fields or songs in the pubs. And some of that folk material went directly into his music, and other elements of it ended up just informing his writing, just giving it a certain accent and, and dialect. So if you think of this tune, for example... County Down, as it's sometimes known. You might recognise it as being the hymn tune that Vaughan Williams used for the words, I heard the voice of Jesus cry. And he also used it in a piece of his, The Five Variants of Dives and Lazarus. And it's a wonderful tune, isn't it? You can really relate to that immediately. There's something about folk music that is a key to a universal sense of what we share as humanity and a common past, a common set of values. And you might say, well, OK, that works for 1920, but what about 2020 with a far more culturally diverse society? Well, even now, when we hear the simplicity of folk material, we're taken to nature. We want to connect with that sense of rural simplicity and that serenity. And throughout The Lark Ascending, we have that sense of serenity. In fact, three times he marks it tranquilo, to be played calmly. So even though the pace may pick up and it may get slightly more emotionally charged, it's all within a very calm framework. 
So even now in 2020, it's a very calming, serene piece, and that's part of its universal appeal. So what Vaughan Williams does particularly successfully is to marry this folk material, this earthiness, and the set of recollections that go with that and what it symbolises with a very sophisticated craft. When you listen to the violin part of this, it's clear that it's been beautifully written for the instrument, absolutely exquisite in terms of the geography and the technicality of it. You can sense that Vaughan Williams himself was a violinist and that Marie Hall, the first performer, had a say in how it was written. So there's that craft and there's also the sophistication of the very subtle accompaniment as well. And it brings to mind an encouragement by Maurice Ravel, with whom he spent a few lessons in 1908. Ravel said, your music should be complex, but not complicated. Complex, mais pas compliqué. And so there is something complex about capturing the freedom of a bird in flight once you try fixing these notes. It's not actually that simple. But when we listen to this, it's important that the ear is drawn to that flight as readily as our eye might be if we're walking out in the grounds and we see the skylark taking to the sky. We have that, that bobbing and spiraling as it goes up into the clouds. In fact, now, even now, when I walk wherever, in Wales, typically, I see the skylark a lot there. I can't see a skylark ascend without hearing strains of Vaughan Williams. I don't know how it is for you. So that marriage of sophistication and of folk material and of the apparently familiar is part of this piece's success. And in fact, not just this piece, but other successful pieces of his as well. I mentioned Dives and Lazarus before and the variants he wrote on that tune. That does exactly the same thing. And if you think of the Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis, again, it's taking something very familiar, a psalm tune, and combining it with music of incredible sophistication. The other part to this piece's magic is the symbolism of the poem on which it is based and the imagination with which Vaughan Williams manages to capture the spirit of that poem. He just takes three key images from the poem. The lark within George Meredith's poem symbolises purity and the flight of the soul, a sense of escape and unutterable beauty. So not just for Meredith, but also before him. In fact, from the Renaissance period on, the lark had almost Christ-like connotations. And so it is in one of the verses that we have this sense of the bird blessing the land beneath, like a cup that overflows. So you have that communion-like reference. And in fact, the bird becomes almost like an intercessional figure, a messenger between us and the divine and the beyond. So where our human cries give way, there the bird song takes over. So let's have a look now as we dive into this wonderful score at how Vaughan Williams marries the sophisticated with the familiar and says so much with so little. The first thing to point out is that it feels very improvisational. There are three quasi-improvised cadenzas on the solo violin at the beginning, middle and ends that hold the whole piece together. And they're based on a simple folk scale, five tones, a pentatonic major scale. So... Immediately there, you have something that feels easy on the ear, and we can connect to it. The introduction moves very simply with these bare fifths, which is quite a folky interval as well. If in classical music you wanted to do the same melody, you'd have to probably do something like... 
something like that. So just the fact that we're moving in that way makes us think of the fields. And by the way, listen to that chord. It's a questioning chord, isn't it? It's just hovering. It has a, a weightlessness to it. And if you don't believe me, let me just give you some alternatives. You know, I could go... Anchored there, it doesn't work. Or um, again, I'm rooted. So the fact that we just have this hovering chord, triple P, really, really quiet, sets up the lark's flight right from the start. And so we have the silver chains of sound from the poem as the violinist goes higher and higher in the register, and you can see how the shape of the music imitates the bobbing quality of the flight as the lark ascends. So there's kind of a little plateau. And within this improvisation, which feels very much in the moment, there are two notes that shine through, a D and a B. And that will stay in your ear, I think, throughout this piece, because those notes get repeated again and again, either here or as the improvisation ends, right at the top of the instrument, in the silver range of the violin, a D and a B. So the flight goes from here, this D, right up to the top D. And once the violin has reached that top D, we get the first sense of a tune. And that will work its way into this first idea. Notice I'm lilting on the piano seat because it's in six. Or one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Why am I saying that? because it's a typical folk time signature, but also because it imitates the rolling of the hills. If I did it like this, it's much more angular, isn't it? Where's the roll gone? No, we need it to be suddenly much more relaxed. So there are four ideas, really, to listen out for. I've played you the first one. And then another one here. And just before that, you get these lovely triads. Triad of three notes at once. And again, that's quite naughty. You don't really do that in cl classical composition. If you ever want to imitate Vaughan Williams, just waft around in, in triads like that, in consecutive motion. And then a third idea. In the middle of the texture there. And above, the violinist flits from embodying the flight of the bird. And perhaps an element of birdsong as well. And taking on a more melodic role. And it's the violinist that first introduced this lovely fourth idea. For me, that sounds the most romantic of the four. Does it to you? And I bring that up because this piece was actually called uh, romance in the style of a Beethoven romance. And it's a romance to the wonderful English countryside, isn't it? And so much more. There, for the first time, Mark Forte, so strongly and into the string, we get that first sense of romance. And that's taken up by the accompaniment later. After that, the soloist 
thickens out the sound by playing two strings at once. So, octaves, and then you get this lovely set of sixths as well. Which is particularly beautiful. So those four ideas make up the first section, which is completed by another little flight of the bird, a, a mini cadenza. There are three sections, and all of them have a pretty obvious pattern to them. They reach an arch in the middle, and they come away. And that's part of the apparent simplicity of this piece, is that we can almost subliminally appreciate that it has a perfect form. So where does he go in the middle section? Well, I think that here he's referring to that part in the poem where Meredith says, "'Tis the love of earth that he instills." How do we get the love of earth? Well... Something that is a little bit more rustic and bucolic. It feels more dance-like, but it's still marked tranquilo, so play it calmly. I think I was a bit too jolly there. We've actually changed time signature here as well, so we're now in two, so one, two, one, two. So the feel changes quite a lot. And with that, the solo violin is asked to play more into the string with a fuller tone. Every single note here has a line above it. A different tone completely. After that vision of life on Earth, we're back in the sky again. And this small episode is scintillating. It's so bright, full of trills, and you get That, in the orchestra, by the way, is a triangle, but on the piano will just be played in a twinkling high register. And beneath that, you get this quite childlike tune. Everything is playful about it, even the rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three. So you've got that cross rhythm involved. Even there, though, even though it seems like a bright new episode, there are still references to old material. And this is part of the complexity of the score that Vaughan Williams writes with just a deft touch, almost sleight of hand, introducing echoes of previous material. So we have, do you remember that? So the theme I called the most romantic of them all, but just echoed there. And also, actually, just those two notes. Do you remember that falling third? Well, there it is again. After all that fizzy energy, we've got to descend back to the earth again. And that's marked in the solo part quite obviously. of the instrument, it doesn't get lower than that bottom note, in fact. So here, the lark has descended. And that descent is echoed, almost slow motion. For me, there are also echoes there of horn calls and perhaps of bells. And it sounds just wonderfully serene and majestic, almost. So now, and so we've now reached the third and final section, where the opening material is reprised. All four of those ideas that I played earlier 
are taken up by the accompaniment and then by the, the soloist, but this time in a deeper, richer register of the violin. And there's a real warmth to it this time. And another little feature just towards the end in the accompaniment, you have these bell-like triads. so beautifully with each other. It's almost as if the earth is speaking to the sky at that moment with echoes of bells. And that sets up the final flight of the lark. We get exactly the same beginning, the same five notes at least that make up the lark's flight. And a lovely little touch, actually, at the end. You think you've reached home. You almost hear this bass note because the violin just centres on a G. And then, just in the final six notes or so, we get this. Remarkably quiet, so distant, and those two notes that have been a red thread throughout the work, the D and the B. Here, the words to go with that from the poem. Till lost on his aerial rings in light, and then the fancy sings. It's almost now as if the lark is so high, it's just a speck, and we wonder whether it's just in our imagination, the fancy singing in that way. And the lark, in a way, is transfigured into pure light, into pure symbol. And what a message of escape from earthly shackles this is. And so much more poignant now to receive this and experience this, not only on its centenary moment, but in our locked down times. Happy listening. Thank you.